Welcome to Top 100 Most Famous Poems of English Literature. Number 40. The Tiger. By William Blake. Tiger, tiger, burning bright, in the forest of the night, what immortal hand or eye, could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies, burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder, and what art, could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand? And what dread feet? What the hammer? What the chain? In what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil? What dread grasp? There its deadly terrors clasp. When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright, in the forest of the night, what immortal hand or eye, dare frame thy fearful symmetry? Number 39. A Dream Within a Dream. By Edgar Allan Poe. Take this kiss upon the brow. And, in parting from you now, thus much let me avow, you are not wrong, who deem that my days have been a dream, yet if hope has flown away in a night, or in a day, in a vision, or in none, is it therefore the less gone? All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. I stand amid the roar of a surf-tormented shore, and I hold within my hand grains of the golden sand, how few. Yet how they creep through my fingers to the deep, while I weep, while I weep. Oh God! Can I not grasp them with a tighter clasp? O oh God! Can I not save one from the pitiless wave? Is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream? Number 38. We Wear the Mask by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. We wear the mask that grins and lies, it hides our cheeks and shades our eyes, this debt we pay to human guile, with torn and bleeding hearts we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise, in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us, while we wear the mask. We smile, but, O oh great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but O oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet, among the mile, but let the world dream otherwise, we wear the mask. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. If you liked our selection, and want to develop your intellectual skills, or just to relax, please subscribe to our channel. YouTube.com, at AI Readers. And follow us. To listen quality poems written by the most famous poets of English literature and read by the most advanced artificial intelligence software. Thank you. Number 37. Ode to a Nightingale. By John Keats. My heart aches, and a drowsy numbness pains my sense, as though of hemlock I had drunk, or emptied some dull opiate to the drains one minute past, and leafy wards had sunk, tis not through envy of thy happy lot, but being too happy in thy happiness that thou, light-winged dryad of the trees, in some melodious plot of beech and green, and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full-throated ease. Oh for a draught of vintage, that hath been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth, tasting of flora and the country green dance and Provençal song, and sunburnt mirth. Oh for a beaker full of the warm south, full of the true, the blushful hippocrene with beaded bubbles winking at the brim, and purple-stained mouth, that I might drink, and leave the world unseen, and with thee fade away into the forest dim. Fade far away, dissolve, and quite forget what thou among the leaves hast never known, the weariness, the fever, and the fret, here, where men sit and hear each other groan, where palsy shakes a few, sad, last gray hairs, where youth grows pale, and spectre thin, and dies, where but to think is to be full of sorrow, and leaden-eyed despairs, where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes, or new love pine them beyond tomorrow. Away! Away! For I will fly to thee, not charioted by Bacchus and his parts, but on the viewless wings of poesy, though the dull brain perplexes and retards, already with thee. Tender is the night, and haply the queen moon is on her throne, clustered around by all her starry fays. But here there is no light, save what from heaven is with the breezes blown through verduros glooms and winding mossy ways. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs, but, in embalmed darkness, guess each sweet wherewith a seasonable month endows the grass, the thicket, and the fruit tree wild, white hawthorn, and the pastoral eglantine, fast fading violets covered up in leaves, and mid-May's eldest child, the coming musk rose full of dewy wine, the murmurous haunt of flies on summer eves. Darkling I listen, and, for many a time I have been half in love with easeful death, called him soft names and many amused rhyme, to take into the air my quiet breath, now more than ever seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain, 
while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy. Still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain, to thy high requiem become a sod. Thou wast not born for death, immortal bird, no hungry generations tread thee down, the voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown, perhaps the selfsame song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth, when, sick for home she stood in tears amid the alien corn, the same that oft-times hath charmed magic casements opening on the foam of perilous seas, in fairy lands forlorn. Forlorn. The very word is like a bell to toll me back from thee to my soul self. Adieu. The fancy cannot cheat so well as she is famed to do, deceiving elf. Adieu. Adieu. Thy plain of anthem fades past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside, and now tis buried deep in the next valley glades, was it a vision, or a waking dream? Fled is that music, do I wake or sleep? Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Number 36. The Sun Rising. By John Dunn. Busy old fool, unruly sun, why dost thou thus, through windows, and through curtains call on us? Must to thy motions lover seasons run? Saucy pedantic wretch, Go chide late schoolboys and sour apprentices, go tell court huntsmen that the king will ride, call country ants to harvest offices. Love, all alike, no season knows nor clime, nor hours, days, months. Which are the rags of time? A beam so reverend and strong, why shouldst thou think? I could eclipse and cloud them with a wink, but that I would not lose her sight so long if her eyes have not blinded thine, look, and tomorrow late tell me whether both th Indias of spice and mine be where thou left them or lie here with me. Ask for those kings whom thou sawst yesterday, and thou shalt hear, all here in one bed lay. She's all states, and all princes, I, nothing else is. Princes do but play us, compared to this, all honors mimic, all wealth alchemy. Thou, son, art half as happy as we, in that the world's contracted thus. Thine age asks ease, and since thy duties be to warm the world, that's done in warming us. Shine here to us, and thou art everywhere, this bed thy center is, these walls thy sphere. Number 35. Mending Wall. By Robert Frost. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen ground swell under it, and spills the upper boulders in the sun, and makes gaps even two can pass abreast. The work of hunters is another thing. I have come after them and made repair where they have left not one stone on a stone, but they would have the rabbit out of hiding, to please the yelping dogs. The gaps I mean, no one has seen them made or heard them made, but at spring mending time we find them there. I let my neighbor know beyond the hill, and on a day we meet to walk the line and set the wall between us once again. We keep the wall between us as we go, to each the boulders that have fallen to each, and some are loaves and some so nearly balls we have to use a spell to make them balance, stay where you are until our backs are turned, we wear our fingers rough with handling them. Oh, just another kind of outdoor game, one on a side. It comes to little more, there where it is we do not need the wall. He is all pine and I am apple orchard. My apple trees will never get across and eat the cones under his pines, I tell him. He only says, good fences make good neighbors. Spring is the mischief in me and I wonder if I could put a notion in his head. Why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it where there are cows? But here there are no cows. Before I built a wall I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out, and to whom I was like to give a fence. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down. I could say elves to him, but it's not elves exactly, and I'd rather he said it for himself. I see him there bringing a stone grasped firmly by the top in each hand, like an old stone savage armed. He moves in darkness as it seems to me, not of woods only and the shade of trees. He will not go behind his father saying, and he likes having thought of it so well he says again, good fences make good neighbors. Number 34. The world is too much with us. By William Wordsworth. The world is too much with us, late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers, little we see in nature that is ours, we have given our hearts away, a sordid boon. This sea that bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours, and are upgathered now like sleeping flowers, for this, for everything, we are out of tune, it moves us not. Great God! Or rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn, so might I, standing on this pleasantly, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn have sight of Proteus rising from the sea, or hear old Triton blow his wreath horn. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Number 33. The New Colossus. By Emma Lazarus. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea washed, 
Sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name mother of exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome, her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep, ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these the homeless tempest toast to me, I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Number 32. The Highwayman. By Alfred Noyes. Part 1. 1. The wind was a torrent of darkness among the gusty trees. The moon was a ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seas. The road was a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor, and the highwayman came riding, 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 the highwayman came riding, up to the old inn door. 2. He had a French cocked hat on his forehead, a bunch of lace at his chin, a coat of the claret velvet, and breeches of brown doeskin. They fitted with never a wrinkle. His boots were up to the thigh. And he rode with a jeweled twinkle, his pistol butts a twinkle, his rapier hilt a twinkle, under the jeweled sky. 3. Over the cobbles he clattered and clashed in the darkened yard. He tapped with his whip on the shutters, but all was locked and barred. He whistled a tune to the window, and who should be waiting there but the landlord's black-eyed daughter, Bess, the landlord's daughter, plating a dark red love knot into her long black hair. 4. And dark in the dark old inn yard a stable wicket creaked where Tim the ostler listened. His face was white and peaked. His eyes were hollows of madness his hair like moldy hay, but he loved the landlord's daughter, the landlord's red-lipped daughter. Dumb as a dog he listened, and he heard the robber say. 5. One kiss, my bonny sweetheart, I'm after a prize tonight, but I shall be back with the yellow gold before the morning light, yet, if they press me sharply, and harry me through the day, then look for me by moonlight, watch for me by moonlight, I'll come to thee by moonlight, though hell should bar the way. 6. He rose upright in the stirrups. He scarce could reach her hand, but she loosened her hair in the casement. His face burnt like a brand as the black cascade of perfume came tumbling over his breast, and he kissed its waves in the moonlight, sweet black waves in the moonlight, then he tugged at his rein in the moonlight, and galloped away to the west. Part 2. He did not come in the dawning. He did not come at noon, and out of the tawny sunset, before the rise of the moon, when the road was a gypsy's ribbon, looping the purple moor, a redcoat troop came marching, 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 King George's men came marching, up to the olden door. 2. They said no word to the landlord. They drank his ale instead. But they gagged his daughter, and bound her, to the foot of her narrow bed. Two of them knelt at her casement, with muskets at their side. There was death at every window, and hell at one dark window for Bess could see, through her casement, the road that he would ride. 3. They had tied her up to attention, with many a sniggering jest. They had bound a musket beside her, with a muzzle beneath her breast. Now, keep good watch. And they kissed her, she heard the doomed man say, look for me by moonlight, watch for me by moonlight, I'll come to thee by moonlight, though hell should bar the way. 4. She twisted her hands behind her, but all the knots held good. She writhed her hands till her fingers were wet with sweat or blood. They stretched and strained in the darkness, and the hours crawled by like years till now, on the stroke of midnight, cold, on the stroke of midnight, the tip of one finger touched it. The trigger at least was hers. 5. The tip of one finger touched it. She strove no more for the rest. Up, she stood up to attention, with the muzzle beneath her breast. She would not risk their hearing, she would not strive again, for the road lay bare in the moonlight, blank and bare in the moonlight, and the blood of her veins, in the moonlight throbbed to her love's refrain. 6. Plot plot, plot plot. Had they heard it? The horse hoofs ringing clear, plot plot, plot plot, in the distance. Were they deaf that they did not hear? Down the ribbon of moonlight, over the brow of the hill, the highwayman came riding, riding, riding. The red coats looked to their priming. She stood up, straight and still. 7. Plot plot, in the frosty silence. Plot plot, in the echoing night. Nearer he came and nearer. Her face was like a light. Her eyes grew wide for a moment. She drew one last deep breath. Then her finger moved in the moonlight. Her musket shattered the moonlight, shattered her breast in the moonlight and warned him with her death. 8. He turned. He spurred to the west. He did not know who stood bowed, with her head or the musket, drenched with her own blood. Not till the dawn he heard it, and his face grew gray to hear how Bess, the landlord's daughter, the landlord's black-eyed daughter, 
had watched for her love in the moonlight and died in the darkness there. 9. Back he spurred like a madman, shrieking a curse to the sky, with the white road smoking behind him and his rapier brandished high. Blood red were his spurs in the golden noon, wine red was his velvet coat, when they shot him down on the highway, down like a dog on the highway, and he lay in his blood on the highway, with a bunch of lace at his throat. 10. And still of a winter's night, they say, when the wind is in the trees, when the moon is a ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seas, when the road is a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor, a highwayman comes riding, 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 a highwayman comes riding, up to the old inn door. 11. Over the cobbles he clatters and clangs in the darkened yard, he taps with his whip on the shutters, but all is locked and barred. He whistles a tune to the window, and who should be waiting there but the landlord's black-eyed daughter, Bess, the landlord's daughter, plating a dark red love knot into her long black hair. Number 31. John Barleycorn by Robert Burns. There was three kings into the east, three kings both great and high, and they hay sworn a solemn oath John Barleycorn should die. They took a plow and plowed him down, put clods upon his head, and they hay sworn a solemn oath John Barleycorn was dead. But the cheerful spring came kindly on, and showers began to fall, John Barleycorn got up again, and sore surprised them all. The sultry sons of summer came, and he grew thick and strong, his head wheel armed wide pointed spears that no one should him wrong. The sober autumn entered mild, when he grew wan and pale, his bending joints and drooping head showed he began to fail. His color sickened more and more, he faded into age, and then his enemies began to show their deadly rage. They've tied a weapon, long and sharp, and cut him by the knee, then tied him fast upon a cart, like a rogue for forgery. They laid him down upon his back, and cudgeled him full sore, they hung him up before the storm, and turned him o'er and o'er. They filled up a darksome pit with water to the brim, they heaved in John Barleycorn, there let him sink or swim. They laid him out upon the floor, to work him farther woe, and still, as signs of life appeared, they tossed him to and fro. They wasted o'er a scorching flame, the marrow of his bones, but a miller rust him worst of all, for he crushed him between two stones. And they hatined his very heart's blood, and drank it round and round, and still the more and more they drank, their joy did more abound. John Barleycorn was a hero bold, a noble enterprise, for if you do but taste his blood, twill make your courage rise. Twill make a man forget his woe, twill heighten all his joy, twill make the widow's heart to sing, though the tear were in her eye. Then let us toast John Barleycorn, each man a glass in hand, and may his great posterity ne'er fail in old Scotland. This was part 7 with the positions from 40 to 31 of our top 100 best poems of English literature. If you liked our selection, and want to develop your intellectual skills, or just to relax, please subscribe to our channel. YouTube.com, at AI Readers. And follow us. To listen quality poems written by the most famous poets of English literature and read by the most advanced artificial intelligence software. Thank you.